before we introduce our speaker and he has his message as our closing message for this year's camp meeting. It has been a custom for us to honor a very special group of people each year that are so vital to the ministry of God here in the Carolinas. Tonight at the close of this meeting, after Pastor Bob shares his message with us, it is our desire to honor those who are serving as volunteer lay pastors and volunteer lay leaders of many of our church plants and our smaller churches. Our first of seven visionary goals for the Quinquennium in the five years between 2016 and 2020 is to pray and commit to raising at least 60 new church plants in the Carolina Conference with 20 new plants in South Carolina and 40 new plants in North Carolina. <clears throat> with all the guidelines and the supporting structure that we have already developed with our church planting ministry, we also hope to make 90 progressional steps. What does that mean? 90 progressional steps of either establishing a new group or transitioning a group to an organized company and eventually organizing companies as established churches in the Carolinas. At the constituency session back in 2011, just before I came here as your servant leader for Christ, we had voted to establish somewhere between 30 to 50 new church plants across North and South Carolina. On December the 17th, 2015, we voted to approve our 30th new church plant. Never in the history of the Carolina Conference have we expanded the work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to encompass more communities with the message and mission of God's end time church. We had a goal of 50 progressional steps for the previous quinquennium and by God's leading and by his blessing, we were able to make it to 51. In 1909, Ellen White received a vision in the night with what she referred to as a very impressive scene. And in that vision, one with authority pointed her to a map picturing God's vineyard that needed to be cultivated and nurtured. This vision referenced in the ninth volume of the testimonies to the church on pages 28 and 29 is where she states this. As light from heaven shone upon anyone that was to reflect the light to others, lights were to be kindled in many places, and from these lights, still other lights were to be kindled. I saw jets of light shining from cities and villages and from the high places and the low places on the earth. God's word was obeyed, and as a result, there were memorials for him in every city and village. His truth was proclaimed throughout all the world. Pastor Bob asked you to pray for certain places where we have no Adventist presence in China. I'm asking you to partner also with us in cities and towns and villages across North and South Carolina that have no Seventh-day Adventist presence. It is by the gracious blessing and the leading of God through our amazing team of volunteer lay pastors and lay leaders that we have seen the advancement of God across the Carolinas between January of 2016 and the end of April of this year. So far, we have established eight new plants in South Carolina for a goal of 20. 16 new plants have been opened in North Carolina from our goal of 40. We still have two more years to go. We have rejoiced with God in seeing 42 steps of progression out of an ultimate goal of 90. I thank God for Elder Brad Cauley and his leadership of our church planning committee, Elder Gary Moyer as the chair of our church planting committee, and Elder Haskell Williams for his leadership of our ministerial council that provides oversight in the training and equipping of men and women who give their hearts and lives in commitment and energy toward advancing God's kingdom across this vineyard of the Carolinas. As we end our service today, we wish to honor 
and uplift these lay volunteer leaders of our church and church plants for using God's, their God-given spiritual gifts to ensure that we have healthy church plants and healthy disciple-making centers for evangelism. By this, we choose to be faithful to God's calling for the growth of his kingdom across the Carolinas. At the end of this service, when they are called, we will call all of these people that have come here tonight, and we thank you for your service for God and for his church. When I was uh, rushing around trying to change from my Pathfinder uniform to this other, and I went into the phone booth to do that, <laughs> I didn't pick up my glow track. But you have your glow track tonight? All right, I see a few. Raise them up. All right, raise them up. Father in heaven, out there, seeds of truth. Once again, this camp meeting is just about finished, and Lord, I'm asking you to go with those seeds of truth, and every hand that is being held up, I'm, I'm praying that you will open up an opportunity for those seeds to be sown and for the Holy Spirit to water and nurture those seeds so that precious hearts will be one for heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, we are honored to have Pastor Bob Falkenberg, Jr. as the president of the Chinese Union Mission as our closing speaker for this camp meeting. Pastor Bob? Shall we pray? Oh God, I pray that we will not have another camp meeting here at Lake June, Alaska. Not because we don't like it here. It's beautiful here. But nothing can compare to being with Jesus. Nothing can compare to that experience that we will have beside the Crystal Sea. No music will compare to the angelic throngs that we will join as we look upon the one who gave his life for us. Tonight, as we close this theme of homesick for heaven, I ask that you will speak through Pastor Bob and that we will walk away from this camp meeting longing for heaven and home. And for that, we open our hearts. Amen. I don't know about you, but when we take a look at the Word of God and we sit down in a setting like this to discuss the Word of God, I don't dare go anywhere or move a step forward without asking the Holy Spirit to guide in this process. So again, would you please bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we've prayed for your Holy Spirit to be here. We have come to this camp meeting seeking a blessing from you, but also seeking to draw closer to you. And your word tonight, we need to hear it. We need to understand it. And we need to take it to heart. So please speak through me and speak to each one of us individually. I pray in your name. Amen. Many times, many times, we wake up in the morning or we go through the day and we are faced with reminders that all is not as it should be in this world. Would you agree with me? And that is why we are homesick for heaven. We long for the day when we will wake up day after day. We can go to see Jesus face to face. We can work in our own home, we can visit with family and friends, we can go and the, Bible, and, and the Bible tells us we will be able to come from Sabbath to Sabbath to worship the King. Helen White tells us that we will wing our way from planet to planet, telling our testimony. What a great day that will be, but we aren't there yet. And just this morning, 
We've been praying, my wife and I, Audrey, and have been praying for my uncle. Many of you might know Don Falkenberg, my dad's brother, Don. He worked for many years with Cher Him here in the Carolina Conference. And a week ago, he was uh, visiting Colorado where his eighth grade, eighth grade graduation, his granddaughter was, no, wait a minute, granddaughter was, gra was graduating from eighth grade. They flew out there, and he was coming into the house, and he slipped and fell, and he hit his head very badly. And uh, after just a few minutes, he started to speak incoherently. They called an ambulance, and he was rushed to the ho hospital. En route to the hospital, he became unconscious. They rushed him into surgery. He had an intracranial bleed, and uh, he never woke up from that surgery. And this morning, right after I finished preaching this morning, I got word that he passed away. You know, things are not as they should be. Death is still lurking. Sadness is all around us. Are we homesick enough for heaven? Do you desire to be prepared to see Jesus come? To be fully surrendered to him so that when he comes in that cloud of glory, you will not ask for the, for the rocks to fall on you, but you will rather look up and say, this is my Savior. If you want to be ready for Jesus, when he comes, may I share with you this story. It's mid-January, 1857. After resting up from an incredibly difficult and tiring journey to Iowa, James and Ellen White once again bundle up and make their way from their home in Battle Creek to the small town of Hillsdale, Michigan, where they will fill Hillsdale, Michigan, where they will fill a speaking appointment for the weekend. Now, you mind, mind you, there were no trains there. They literally got in their sled and traveled the 55 miles from Battle Creek to Hillsdale. They were there the weekend of February 13 to 15, 1857, to attend a conference called by J.H. By Wagner, scheduled to meet in Waldron's Hall. And I have scoured the Internet. You know, Dr. Google seems to know everything. But I could not find a picture of Waldron's Hall. But it was there. It was called Waldron's Hall. And we know about this meeting because one of those presents, a lady by the name of Louisa Morton, wrote down in her diary what took place in that convocation of Adventists in that part of Michigan. You see, Louisa Morton, who was an attendee at the meeting, was actually a skeptic. She had been an Adventist and now was a discouraged Adventist and did not really believe all this stuff about the three angels message and about the Sabbath and about the sanctuary. She was a skeptic, especially about this lady who by the name of Ellen White. And she gives an interesting description of the conference. And now I am reading from her diary. She says, there were 200 Sabbath keepers present, all firm believers in the third angel's message. I must say, I was very surprised when I heard the evidence presented in favor of present truth. They had a Bible to prove every view they presented in favor of present truth. And more than all of that, the Holy Spirit bore witness to the same. She goes on to say, at the last meeting, Sister White was taken off in vision. It was the most solemn scene I have ever witnessed. It has made an impression on my mind that can never be erased while reason and life remain. So we can go back on live now again. As we go back to Hillsdale there in Waldron's Hall, this Louisa Morton, who was a skeptic, is writing in her, her 
diary saying, I was amazed that everything that was presented regarding present truth was actually found in the Bible. And then she says, and I haven't gone to this part, at the last meeting, Sister White was taken off in vision. I mentioned it, but I want to highlight this. Was taken off in vision. Remember, she is a skeptic, and she's writing this. It was the most solemn scene I had ever witnessed. It has made an impression on my mind that can never be erased while reason and life remain. When I read this, I couldn't help but ask myself, what was it that God showed Sister White in that vision on that cold February day? And I searched and I searched and I found the vision. And I want to share it with you. Why am I sharing it with you? Because you told me at the beginning of this sermon that you wanted to be ready to meet Jesus. Did you not? And this message is for you and me today more than ever. And I want to share it with you. What was the content of this vision? Let me share it with you. It's found in the first volume of the testimonies, page 141 and onwards. And you can read it here. The Lord has shown me in vision some things concerning the church in its present lukewarm state, which I will relate to you. The church was presented before me in vision. And by the way, this is what she saw in Hillsdale, Michigan, in Waldron's Hall, when this skeptic took down notes about what was happening. This is the vision. She said, the church was presented be before me in vision. Said the angel to the church, Jesus speaks to thee, be zealous and repent. This work I saw should be taken hold of in earnest. And then she goes on to say, there is something to repent of. And what is that? Worldly mindedness, selfishness, and covetousness have been eating out the spirituality and life of God's people. Oh, how precious was this promise as it was shown to me in vision. I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Oh, the love, the wondrous love of God. Amen? Up until that time, and by the way, when Ellen White started to share this and write this testimony out and share it with the church, and by the way, at that time, there were only a few thousand people in the church. This is before we were even Seventh-day Adventists. She wrote this out, and she started sending it out to the churches, and there was a backlash. There was a pushback. Why is that? Because up until that time, the Adventists, the believers of the Adventist church, thought that those who were lukewarm, the Laodicean church, were those outside the church, the Adventists who had not accepted the three angels' message. It wasn't them. They were the true, the faithful. And here, God is telling his remnant church, you are the church of Laodicea. You are lukewarm. Yes, you're the remnant, but now God is calling you lukewarm. This was startling, shocking for those gathered in Hillsdale as well as for those who read the testimony of that vision. And tonight I ask you, as we end this wonderful camp meeting, how does it sit for you? How do you feel when you receive this message from the messenger of God that says to me, Bob, and says to you, you are lukewarm? I would like tonight, if you don't mind, in the few minutes I have, just to take seriously this injunction. And go back to Revelation chapter 3 and look at the message that Jesus wrote to us about the Laodicean church. If you have your Bibles tonight, I'll put it up on the screen as well. But we're going to go just quickly to Revelation chapter 3, 14, because it has everything to do with us living at the end of time. This is a message to us, Sister White says. This is a message to us, Jesus says, who is the faithful and the true witness. Revelation chapter 3, 14 starts by saying, And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, and I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I know your works, he says. You see, God knows us intimately. Do you agree with me? 
there's nothing you can hide from him. He knows your pretenses, and he knows your excuses, and he knows your heart. He knows you through and through, and so the faithful and true witness starts his testimony to the Seventh-day Adventist Church here tonight by saying, you can't hide. I know you. I know your works tonight. The inside and out, we, I know when you don't tell the truth, and I know when you tell the truth. I know that when you hide things from me and you hide things from others, I am telling you the spirit of man the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the inner depths of his heart, Proverbs 20 says. I know the inner workings of who you are. And that is why he goes on to say in Revelation chapter 3, 17 to 18, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind and naked. And that's because I know you. You think you're A, but I know you're B. He stops and he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and that you anoint your eyes with salve that you may see. And he concludes the three angels' message by saying, and as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And behold, I stand at the door and knock, right? I stand at the door and knock, right? If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus starts by saying, don't make excuses. Listen to me because I know your works. He knows the secrets of the heart, the Bible says. He says that he knows our hearts just as if he's turning on a lamp in our heart and he can see everything there. And then he says, because I know you, I am calling you lukewarm. And what does this lukewarm mean? I don't know if any of you have been to Laodicea in, in, in Turkey. They call it Laodikea. I've been there before, and you can still see the pipes that came from the hot springs up there in Pamakali. You can see where they brought the hot water down into the city of Laodicea. But by the time that hot water got to Laodicea, it was what? Lukewarm. So as this was pinned to that church, they understood exactly what it meant. You know, if you come to China, you will rarely find cold water. The Chinese think it's unhealthy to drink cold water. In the middle of the summer, you want a drink of water at the drinking fountain or whatever, it's hot, hot water. And I'm just telling you here, I'm just confessing to you, my wife has been in China too long. She always orders hot water now, too, anywhere, wherever we go. But I like my cold water with the ice. So you see, neither of us are lukewarm. She's hot, I'm cold. <laughs> but in the context of the Scripture, Jesus looks at me and looks at my wife and looks at you tonight and says, why is it that you are not hot or cold? I'd rather you be completely in rebellion against me than to go around with a sign that says, I am okay. The issue is, I don't know many people that like to drink warm water, and I don't think my God, according to the Scripture, likes disciples that are lukewarm. Another way of saying this is what we find in James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to God is the counsel of Scripture, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and pure your, purify your hearts. You what? Your what? Well, if this was in Chinese, although I know it doesn't say this in Chinese, it could say, you mama hoo hoo Christians. Those of you here this morning, you know what I'm talking about double-minded Christians. Listen to what Ellen White says. The enemy will seek to intrude himself even amid your religious exercises. Every avenue will need to be faithfully guarded lest selfishness and pride become interwoven with your works. If self has really been crucified with the affections and lust, the fruit will appear in good works to the glory of God. I entreat you in the fear of God not to let your works degenerate. Be consistent, symmetrical Christians. Have you ever heard that before? 
symmetrical Christians. When the heart has given its affections to Christ, old things are passed away and all things have become new. Can you say amen? You see, when we become Christ, we are His. How many of you here are married this evening? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, put them down. How many of you here are half married? Raise your hand. Yeah, I see my point exactly. That's exactly my point. Jesus is saying here, if you are mine, let it be reflected in your life, in your words, in your thoughts, in your mind. Amen? You say, you say we are full of, that's what the Bible says, you say you are rich and you're, you're wealthy and you are well-dressed and so on and so forth, but the Bible says you are got it wrong. You're not rich. You need everything. You're poor. And the Greek here for poor is not just, well, I'm lacking a little money. No, you are poor like a beggar. We don't have... We can see clearly, but the Bible says we are blind. We feel like we're well-dressed, but the Bible says we're naked because he knows our works and he knows our hearts and he sees our double-mindedness. I remember reading a Barna report some years back that shook me to the core. As you know, Barna does a lot of studies of Christian thinking, Christian behavior, Christian values in North America. And they said this in this report, by far the most common religious practice among adults is praying. Overall, 82% of all Americans, including 90% of all Protestants and 88% of Catholics, prayed to God within the past seven days. Are you with me? Then they go on to say, the figures are highest among those who attend a Pentecostal church, 97% of whom said they had prayed in the past week, and they are lowest among those who attend the Seventh-day Adventist church, 79%. You think you are rich and increased with good. But my Jesus knows me, knows you lukewarm how can we have the power to finish the race and complete the mission without being fully surrendered to Jesus Christ Ellen White says half-hearted Christians are worse than infidels for their deceptive words and noncommittal position lead many astray. The infidel shows his colors, but the lukewarm Christian deceives both parties. He is neither a good worldling nor a good Christian. Satan uses him to do a work that no one else can do. Please forgive me. I'm trying to be honest with us tonight, okay? This is the spirit of prophecy speaking to us. The remnant church at the end of time and he, she says, half-hearted, mama hoo hoo Christians are worse than infidels. Now, I thank God. I thank God that the Scriptures do not stop there. That my Jesus does not say, you are lukewarm and I want to spew you out of my mouth. He doesn't stop there. He goes on to give us counsel. And isn't that just like Jesus? He does not say, I am telling you, you better shape up. He treats us like I now have to treat my grown-up children who are married and older. I can't tell them to go to their room. I have to treat them with respect and as adults. And this is what Jesus does with us. He never forces his love and opinion on us. Do you agree with me? He says, I counsel thee. I counsel thee. Let me just put my arm around you and say, listen, you're in a bad state. Let me give you some advice. Buy gold of me. Your gold is worthless. It will disappear. Buy gold of me. And you can't see clearly, so why don't you come and, and let me buy the, the right eye salve that will help you see the universe next door, that will help you see things clearly. Let me help you buy the right kind of suit. The ones you wear are drawing attention to yourself. Let me bring you and cover you with white raiments. 
of my righteousness. I love that. Ellen White says, I saw that if any needed I salve, it is those who have earthly possessions. Many of them are blinded by their own state, blind of their firm grasp upon this world. Oh, that they might see. The question tonight, brothers and sisters, is why does he speak so boldly to us? Why does Jesus basically grab us and say, do you get it? And I want to say the reason he does so is because he loves us. He loves us. He wants to help us be clothed in his righteousness. He wants us to help us see things with spiritual eyesight. He wants to unplug our ears so that we can hear the sweet, small voice of his spirit. He wants us to enter into communion with him. Isn't that what happened? Isn't that exactly what happened? At the end of this, this tremendously direct counsel on the part of Jesus, what do we see? The most beautiful picture, do we not? of Jesus standing outside the door, knocking. Do you not think that Jesus has the key? He knows. He, he's God. But he stands out, and he knocks on the door. And he says, Bob, I can hear you in there. Come on, man. I hear you rattling around the kitchen there. Don't pretend you're not in there. Bob, I'm here. Bob, I'm here. Bob, aren't you willing to open the door and let me come in and enjoy fellowship with you? You see, brothers and sisters, when you look at the book of Revelation, you find that in Revelation chapter 3, Christ says to the church in Philadelphia, I have set before you an open door which no man can close. There are two doors here. One is his open door, and what is that? That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The door has been swung open for the world to come into the kingdom of God. Amen? That's wonderful news. That's salvation. This is what we are to leave here and share with the world. But here, when we come to the Laodicean message, the, the last of those, those messages to the churches, the door is not open. It's what? It's closed, and it's shut, and no one can answer, answer it. No one can open it except those on the inside, except you and except me. We are living in the last days, brothers and sisters. We are the church to which the true witness is pleading with. And so tonight, as I conclude this message, as we conclude this camp meeting, as we are homesick for heaven, please, please, I beg you, I admonish myself as I admonish you, open the door. Open the door. Be zealous and repent. Let me go back to the story of Ellen White in Hillsdale. Because the witnesses that were present when she went into vision said that when she came out of vision, for a few minutes she repeated these words that I'm about ready to read to you over and over and over and over again. What were those words? They were taken straight from Scripture. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22. She repeated these words again and again, Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Indeed, we do come to you, for you are the Lord, our God. Return, you backsliding children. Return, you backsliding children. Open the door. Open the door. Is your Jesus outside the door? Open the door. Is your Jesus standing in the foyer of your heart only? Let him into the living room. Is your Jesus in your living room but no further? No, no, no. Open the door to every room and closet in your entire heart. Can you say amen? 
Let him have full access. Let him fill you with the Holy Spirit that you can leave this place sharing the wonderful news of reconciliation through Jesus Christ and preaching the soon coming of Jesus. But my friend, we need to repent. We need to come full circle and open that door and let Jesus fully into our heart. Tonight, I want to invite you as we close this camp meeting to make a decision. I want to sing a song. I want to sing a song together, and it's a cappella. And I'm so glad I have a choir behind me. And it's a song that is a prayer, and it goes like this. I don't know if you've heard it. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I what? You've heard it. Tonight, I want to invite you. If you want to say, Jesus, we're leaving here soon. We're going into the world and full of temptation and distractions. But my Jesus, tonight I am opening the door. I'm swinging it open and giving you complete access to my heart. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. As we sing this song and you want to sing it as your prayer tonight, I invite you to stand and sing it with me, okay? All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. From your heart, your heart, I surrender. sing the next stanza, I just want to ask you, maybe there are some here tonight that have wandered quite a distance from your Jesus. And tonight you say, Bob, I want a special prayer. I want to invite you to come forward as we sing this next stanza. If you need, I want to have a closing prayer together. And if you want to come forward saying, Jesus, I need you again. Forgive me. I repent. I come to you. Come to the front. We'll have a prayer together. Let's sing this next stanza and may it be your prayer tonight. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou to the front for a prayer. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. Let's pray tonight. Father in heaven, you are so compassionate and merciful. Time and again we come to you, and time and again we walk away from you. Time and again we ask for your forgiveness, but yet time and again we ignore you. Dear God, tonight please forgive us. Lord, we come before you tonight asking you to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to cover us with your white garments, to place that healing salve on our eyes so that we can see the spiritual and act upon it before we do the temporal. Dear Jesus, tonight we have heard your invitation to repent. We've heard your call knocking on our heart's door. 
And we're standing tonight. We've come forward tonight because we surrender all. We surrender all. You're hearing their prayers tonight. My brothers and sisters are praying right now, Lord. They are surrendering all. Jesus, you're coming soon. This is no time to be straddling the fence. You are calling each one of us to be used by you to proclaim this gospel, to be fully surrendered to you. Dear, and so here we are, surrendering everything to you. You've heard our prayer. You've heard our heart's desire. The door is swung open, and now please come into our hearts. Take us as holy thine. Use us. And may tomorrow and the next day and the next day, may our life reflect a committed and fully consumed life of a disciple of Christ. This is our prayer. And we thank you for hearing us and accepting us through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we close our camp meeting, I'd like to invite you to stand and uh, stretch hands across the aisle. And at the same time, I'd like our volunteer lay pastors and our volunteer lay leaders of our church to join me up on this platform, along with our officers and their spouses. I'd like to invite them to come up here. And while we're transitioning to that and, uh, and those lay leaders are coming up, if you are a lay leader or you are a lay pastor of any of our church plants, we invite you to come up as we have this special prayer of blessing for you. And we'd like to invite our fellow officers to come and uh, uh, we'll get the PowerPoint up on, uh, on our final song here, but we want to have a special prayer of blessing uh, on all of these wonderful, wonderful men and women of God that God is using to help finish his work across the Carolinas. While they're coming up, I do have a couple of announcements. Michael Odium, one of our literature evangelists, will be in the Herald Center after the meeting for those that are interested in the Bible storybooks. They've gone out of print, but he has those available. And so uh, if you are interested in obtaining a copy of the Bible storybooks, uh, you can see him in the, at the lower level of the uh, Herald Hall. We had also a number of ferns that were used to decorate uh, the, the stage, and we, we don't want to throw those away, so if you would like to get those ferns, uh, we're giving them away, basically, I think. Um, so if you'd like one of those ferns, please come and see uh, Beth Grissom, our prayer ministries coordinator and, and the decorator for our stage at the end of the program. And so those, those we will be giving away so that they just won't go to waste. We're going to bow our heads and offer a prayer of blessing upon these lay leaders first. And then we're going to ask you to join us as we sing this song of our closing. Now, we do have an opportunity here. For, I, I don't think he's called for that, is, has he? Uh, and if you have filled out um, one of the cards. I was just reminded by one of the ushers. I don't think we took up a collection for that. Um, they will be standing at the doors. And as you go out, please be sure to make sure you turn those in, those envelopes, if you've filled out one of those. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious God and Father in heaven, standing up here on this platform on this closing night of our camp meeting, are men and women who have dedicated their gifts, the gifts that you have given them to lead and to guide and to nurture our church plants, whether small groups or companies or companies that are transitioning to churches. Lord, you have used their giftedness to advance your kingdom across the Carolinas. I pray for your special blessing upon them. I pray for your special blessing upon their families. Lord, 
whatever challenges and struggles the enemy of man may place in their way, may they see Jesus as their faithful companion to give them wisdom and courage and strength and joy and hope and peace so that they will be faithful to the cause that you have called them to lead. Lord, we ask this blessing upon these lay leaders, and we thank you for them, and we thank you so much for their heartfelt willingness to offer their services for Jesus Christ and his church. We ask this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me as we sing. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels guide uphold you. With his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again till we meet till we meet till we meet at Jesus feet till we meet till we meet God protecting Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And may the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you and good night.